To begin with, let me say that a constitution is the political architect's master plan for the nation. It's a body of fundamental law that describes the manner in which the state is organized, government carried on, and justice administered. At the organizational level, the constitution creates the various organs of the state. At the political level, the constitution concerns itself with the location of authority in the state. Who can do what and in what manner, in what procedure. That's a primary concern of the constitution. In the area of human rights, the constitution seeks to provide a balance between society's need for order and the individual's right to freedom. The might of the state and the rights of the citizens are sought to be balanced. At the philosophical level, or at the ideological level, if you please, the Constitution supplies the fundamental or core or political, core political, religious, moral, cultural, and economic values on which society is founded. Um, the Malaysian Constitution, surprisingly, does not have a preamble. In most constitutions, the preamble will lay down the ideology of the state. We don't, but that doesn't mean that there are no values. Clearly, they are there in the Constitution, implicit, uh, and we have to uh, extract them. Constitutional law is also set against the panorama of history, geography, economics, and other fields. More than most other fields of law, the Constitution reflects the demands, the dreams, the values, the vulnerabilities of the body politic. Um, I think you'll agree with me that a constitution cannot be an objectively beautiful, well-drafted document. It will not endure unless it reflects to some extent the folks guise that is the spirit of the people. It must to some extent reflect the existentialist socio-political imperatives of society. It must reflect the realities, but of course, Nothing is right just because it was, or because it is, or because it is going to be. And so, here lies a sublime challenge. A constitution must also be idealistic, aspirational, and transformative. It must contain within its seeds for a better and new social order. It must balance stability with change. Um, in a fragmented and ethnically divided society as Malaya was in 1957, the constitution must seek to weld people together into one common nationality. Uh, if there are regions, and in um, many countries there are indeed regions, states, or provinces that exhibit significant differences from the rest of the country, then the constitution must maintain unity in diversity by granting special autonomy to such regions. For example, Quebec in Canada, Kashmir in India, and Sabah Sarawak in Malaysia. So in other words, every constitution must tackle the challenge of religious, ethnic, regional, and religious diversity, something that Dr. Ong very correctly pointed out. Our forefathers tried very hard to achieve a balance between many, many conflicting needs. Now, the federal constitution has 183 articles and 13 schedules, and uh, they um, embody, in my view, about 18 major features. I, I will not outline them right now. I'll go to them uh, right away. Number one, supreme constitution protected by uh, judicial review. Unlike the UK, where there is no written constitution, Malaya in 1957 adopted a written and supreme charter. Actually, the choices were quite a few. Uh, Malaya could have adopted uh, the British model of a supreme parliament, or perhaps the historical model of supreme Malay rulers, or a supreme constitution, um, or um, um, the supremacy of the Sharia. So there were four major choices, the choice was made that there will be a supreme constitution. Articles 4 
and 162 clause 6 uh, clearly affirm the supremacy of the basic law over all pre and post independence legislation. Uh, Article 4 clause 1 is quite short. I'll just read that out. It says very clearly, this constitution is the supreme law of the federation and any law passed after Merdeka Day which is inconsistent with it shall to the extent of the inconsistency be void. 162 clause 6 is about pre Merdeka law. Uh, if it violates the constitution, it must either be repealed or it must be modified. And remarkably, the courts were given the power to modify Prima Deca laws to make the Prima Deca law fall in line with the Perlimbagan. Now, these articles clearly imply that our parliament is not supreme. There are two types of limitations on parliament's powers, substantive, in other words, topics or things which they can or cannot do, and procedural, that is, how they must go about exercising their power. State assemblies are likewise limited in their legislative competence. Though there is no constitutional court, as there is in some countries like Germany, superior courts have the power and a duty to nullify federal and state legislation if there is inconsistency with the Supreme Constitution. Sad to say that a largely British-trained judiciary has been reluctant to invalidate acts of parliament or state assembly legislation on constitutional grounds. The tendency is to avoid or to evade constitutional issues uh, and to convert or to demote constitutional issues into issues of administrative law. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the doctrine of ultra vires or natural justice. Uh, a, a good example would be the Aliran case uh, from Penang itself. Aliran uh, used to print in um, English and it was critical of the government and that was tolerated. But then it wanted to print in Malay. Uh, printing in Malay would mean it would now go into the Malay heartland. Uh, that was uh, forbidden. Aliran went to the court and Aliran said, we have free speech under Article 10. Uh, free speech is forbidden uh, on eight grounds, order, security, incitement to an offense, friendly relation with other states, contempt of court, contempt of parliament, defamation morality. We have not violated any one of those, so how can you prevent us from printing in Malay? Aliran also said, how about Article 152, Bahasa Malayu is our national language, how can you stop us? Aliran said, Article 8, equality, Utusan consumer in Penang prints in Malay, why can't Aliran print in Malay. So Aliran had three great constitutional arguments. In any other country, actually, this would have taken 20, 30 pages on each article for the judges to pronounce their judgment. Uh, our judges, on the other hand, converted the whole case into a case of administrative law. The judges said, under the Printing Presses and Publications Act, the minister has a discretion. Minister has exercised his discretion and in our opinion, there is no abuse of power, and that's the end of the matter. The issues of Article 10, freedom of speech, Article 8, equality, Article 152, BM, were absolutely avoided or evaded. Um, I, I should not say this, but it's afternoon, so I, I want to wake you up a little bit. Uh, the judge in question was called Justice Ajayb Singh, and he truly gave a very Ajayb decision. Now, um, if one were to look at some of the uh, cases, there are about 22 cases, I, I, I won't go into them, um, about 22 cases where um, at some stage of the proceeding, um, the legislation was held to be unconstitutional. Uh, sadly, uh, out of these 22 cases, eight of these rulings were reversed on appeal. Two were swept aside by legislative amendments. That leaves only 12 cases in 59 years where judicial review left an impact. So I am sorry to report to you that judicial review of legislation on constitutional grounds is not a significant aspect of Malaysian constitutional jurisprudence. Constitutional supremacy is largely notional, a legal myth, a magnificent facade. Um, opportunities to assert 
constitutional supremacy have occurred on many, many occasions, and sadly, judges have uh, turned them down. For example, in Eng Kyok Cheng, uh, an emergency ordinance had delegated very wide powers to the Yang Di Pertonagong. This is a famous doctrine in India that the delegate can delegate, but not too much. The delegate can delegate only matters of detail, but not matters of principle or policy. Policy principle must be laid down by the parliament itself. Uh, the court rejected Eng Kyok Cheng. In the amendment process, parliament often amends. How much can it amend? Can it amend the fundamental features of the constitution? I just want to ask you again, again to wake you up, uh, let me uh, ask you a question. Article 55, clause 3 says, the life of parliament is five years. Let's say the prime minister and his government um, introduce an amendment. Article 55, clause 3 is hereby amended to substitute for the word five, the words 25. Just, just change one word, five to 25. And let us say the prime minister gets two thirds majority. This will require two thirds. Can you amend the constitution to change a five year tenure to a 25 year tenure or a 55 year tenure? Well, this would raise the interesting issue of basic structure of the constitution. Can you use the constitution to destroy the constitution? Can you abuse the amendment process to take away the basic pillars of the constitution? basic structure. In India, the courts have said to Parliament, whatever majority you have, you cannot amend the constitution to destroy its fundamental core basic structure. Our courts have been invited to adopt this. Um, they have not clearly rejected the doctrine, neither have they accepted. So the point I was making is our courts are reluctant to rely on constitutional jurisprudence from the USA, from India, Australia uh, to um, decide cases. They tend to be a little bit English in their attitude and that is that uh, the ultimate question is has the executive acted under the law? And they forget that in Malaysia there is a further question, is the law in accordance with the supreme constitution? So we have a further level which our judges don't generally um, don't generally investigate. However, in contrast with legislation, constitutional review of executive actions is uh, not uncommon. In a number of cases, courts have uh, done their job to censor abuse of power. Uh, for example, um, um, I think last year or year before, um, the um, protesters were wearing yellow t-shirts uh, and the Home Minister said uh, that's uh, uh, illegal and the Court of Appeal said that's an unreasonable exercise of power. Now, to me, that was a great decision, but it, was, it still fell short of constitutional standards as I would like as a student of constitutional law. The Court said the Minister's action was unreasonable. The Court never looked at the law which allowed the Minister such wide discretion. It is well accepted in many countries. If a legislative rule confers absolute discretion, that rule is unconstitutional on the ground of equality before the law. Because if you delegate to me, or if you confer on me unlimited power, then I can treat like as alike and unlike as alike. And that's a violation of the equality rule. So the court censored the minister, but didn't go the next step in censoring the law. Um, a number of such cases. I also want to say with uh, uh, some um, happiness that constitutional literacy is spreading and more and more lawyers trained in Malaysian constitutional law are raising constitutional issues. I think there are about four judges at the moment uh, on the bench who are locally trained and I'm not saying that uh, with any uh, uh, disrespect. I think it's good they are studying, they have studied Malaysian constitutional law. To me, uh, Tansri, it's a scandalous situation that a person can become a lawyer in Malaysian courts. Apologies to those of you who are lawyers. Eh? Uh, a person can become a lawyer in Malaysian courts or a judge in Malaysian courts 
without studying the Malaysian constitution for a single day. It's like me being appointed a, a of course they'll never do that, uh, me being appointed a Sharia judge without having read the Al-Quran. Really, how can you become a judge or a lawyer in a Malaysian court unless you have studied, unless you have undergone a bridging course in Malaysia's supreme law. But we, we do that. Uh, and I think the consequence is quite clear that uh, our judges tend to evade or avoid, lawyers also evade or avoid issues. Uh, sadly, the area of non-justiciability is very wide. Non-justiciability is that there are some areas the judges say, uh, this is too political, or this is policy, uh, it's an economic issue, uh, it's not fit for judicial intervention. At other times, courts will decline. And let me give an example of non-justiciability. Is there emergency or not? Uh, it's a political issue. Uh, are you a threat to national security? Uh, that's a political issue for the minister to decide in his subjective discretion. So that's the concept of non-justiciability. In democracies, every democracy, there are some issues of non-justiciability. For example, declaring war, making peace. That's not for judges to decide. I think that's for the government. But in most democracies, the area of non-justiciability is rather narrow. Our problem is that our non-justiciability extends to emergency proclamations, preventive detention orders, power of pardon, decisions under the Societies Act, transfer of civil servants, decisions under the Printing Presses uh, Act, the Aliran decision, compulsory acquisition of property orders. Compensation is payable, but the decision to acquire, uh, that is non-reviewable. Um, Attorney General's powers under Article 145 to prosecute or not to prosecute, to transfer cases laterally or horizontally, to apply um, either the ISA or the dangerous drugs, uh, sorry, or the uh, um, um, Firearms Act or the Arms Act, three separate laws on gun violation. The ISA is now gone, but at one time there were three separate laws. Which law to apply? That's for the Attorney General to decide. Proceedings of the State Assembly, and I think rightly so, are not reviewable by the courts. Many people will support that, though in India, the courts have said, if the Assembly or Parliament violates fundamental rights, the citizen has a right of recourse to the courts. Assembly cannot hide behind parliamentary privileges uh, to violate fundamental rights. Now, beside judicial reticence, judicial review of executive and legislative action is further weakened by what are called ouster clauses. The law itself will say the decision of the minister is final and conclusive, not to be questioned, reviewed, quashed in any proceedings. Well, in England, in India, the courts have found a way um, to denude ouster clauses of their effect. The court have said decision, the word decision means valid decision. If it's an invalid decision, it's a nullity. So, your decision is final as long as you stayed within your perimeters. The moment you exceeded your perimeters, the decision is a nullity. So, the courts have been activist in some countries. An alarming development in this country, from my point of view, is that uh, in some cases, uh, the executive ignores court orders. Um, whether it is custody order uh, for a mother or whether it is a uh, uh, case of Nick Nazmi, Nick Ahmad. Uh, um, the Court of Appeal had declared Section 9, Clause 5 uh, of the Peaceful Assemblies Act unconstitutional. The Attorney General appealed. Pending the appeal, the authorities were still using this section. Uh, legally, that's wrong. Once a section is declared unconstitutional, it is unconstitutional till the constitutionality is restored by the superior court. In the interim period, they must obey the law. They must obey the law till the law is restored, till the court makes a decision. So that's a very alarming development that court decisions are not being enforced by some executive authorities. Our next one, a federal system Unlike the unitary system in the UK, uh, Malaysia has a federal form of dual government. We are not a unitary state um, as in the UK or as in Singapore. Now, I want to clarify, unitary and dual, uh, unitary and federal are not synonymous with good 
government or bad government. No, these are forms of government. Both can be good and both can be bad, depending on how it is working. Systems are as good as the people who administer them. Um, the point of federal systems is that there is a division of legislative, executive, judicial, and financial powers between the central government and the states, uh, which states in their area are autonomous or semi-autonomous. In Malaysia, however, the weightage is heavily, very heavily in favor of the center, especially in matters of finance. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing because there was no compelling reason for Malaysia to be a federal state, except for the fact that we have nine Malay rulers whose sovereignty had to be acknowledged. Well, Malaysia is a small country territorially, and uh, there was no uh, great uh, emphasis in 1959 on having separate languages, unlike in India, where there are actually 24 languages recognized in the constitution. Uh, here there was Bahasa Malayu. So uh, uh, I think the federal sentiment was not strong. Uh, nevertheless, because of the rulers' uh, uh, sovereignty, we became a federal state. Uh, understandably, uh, the preponderance is in favor of the federal government. However, the federation's primacy is less pronounced in relation to Sabah Sarawak, and for understandable reasons, um, um, Sabah Sarawak came in on the condition that uh, their powers would be greater than the powers of the peninsula states, and uh, um, for a, a number of uh, in a number of ways, Sabah Sarawak uh, have greater power. For example, um, uh, the state government's legislative power is regulated by the state list. But for Sabah Sarawak, there is a supplementary state list. For Sabah Sarawak, there are additional sources of revenue. If you wish to amend the constitution, in West Malaysia, there is no need to consult with the states. But if you amend the constitution to affect the rights of Sabah Sarawak, you have to get the consent of the governors of Sabah Sarawak. This is a very large area of the special provision for Sabah Sarawak, very large and very controversial area. I won't go into that right now. Uh, let me go on to the next point. Um, fundamental liberties in response to the uh, era of human rights after World War II. Um, um, let me clarify, however, I'm not suggesting that human rights began only after World War II. I'm not suggesting that human rights began um, uh, only in Europe and America, not at all. Human rights are known to all civilizations, to all religions. But um, after World War II, there was a renewed emphasis because of the atrocities of World War II conducted primarily uh, in, in Europe. Um, so uh, our constitution in articles 5 to 13 and elsewhere uh, provided for a large number of political, civil, cultural, and economic rights. But largely, the emphasis was on political rights, largely. You know, in some constitutions like India, there's a chapter on directive principles of state policy, about animal husbandry, about uh, uh, education of women, um, about the rights of the poor. Our constitution is m more modeled on Western constitutions, where emphasis is on political rights. For example, there is no mention of the rights of workers to work, of a minimum wage, water, food, jobs, housing, uh, medical care. There's no mention. To me, these are also essential rights. Uh, these are also essential rights, socioeconomic rights, uh, called the second generation rights. So we have personal liberty, Article 5. I can't go into all of them in great detail, but just to mention just one article Article 5, it says, no person shall be deprived of life or liberty save in accordance with law. Each word here, person, life, personal liberty, law, each word here is pregnant with meaning. One could write a PhD thesis on each word. For example, life, what is life? Is life simply living and breathing? Or does life also include the dignity of life? Does it include the necessities of life, like a job? Uh, does liberty include a woman's right to abortion on demand? Does liberty include your right to communicate with your family while you are in prison? Does liberty include your right to have 
an education for upward mobility while you are in detention. So these are words that are fantastic in meaning, life, liberty, property. Um, uh, if Article 5 is given a prismatic interpretation, by, by which I mean a light hits the prism and once the light comes out, actually it spreads out into many, many directions. Uh, Gopal Sri Ram, um, um, judge of the Court of Appeal, did that along with some other brother judges. Occasionally they did that. Article 5 can confer many unenumerated rights not explicitly mentioned in the constitution. May I just give one example? That is say, police arrest someone on reasonable suspicion of a crime. Take him, fingerprint him, uh, uh, charge him, take him to court, and a date is fixed then for mention of the case. But for reasons, let us say, uh, witnesses cannot be found, the judge fell sick, the lawyer fell sick, the case is postponed, postponed, postponed. Months pass, sometimes years pass. There have been cases where people have waited up to eight years, seven, eight years for their day in court. Is the detention unlawful? He was arrested lawfully on reasonable suspicion of an arrestable offense. All the procedures were followed. Does he have a right to an expeditious trial? The constitution is silent. So, nothing to condemn here. No law can be comprehensive. Life is always larger than the law. So the judges now have to adopt a prismatic interpre interpretation to say, when you are conferred personal liberty, it must imply an inherent right to an expeditious trial. So I just want to point out to you that this prismatic interpretation is nothing revolutionary. Uh, judges have to interpret the law creatively, holistically, purposively with a view to give life to the law. Um, um, abolition of slavery, Article 6. Um, um, many women complain that housework is also slavery and it has not been abolished. Eh? Um, there is protection against retrospective criminal laws. Laws cannot be backdated. In, in some countries, no law can be backdated. In Malaysia, only criminal laws which create an offense or increase the penalty, only they cannot be retrospective. But civil laws can be retrospective. No double jeopardy. You can't be punished again and again for the same offense. That's what the Perlambagan says. In actual practice, what happens is this. After a criminal case, preventive detention takes place. Or after preventive detention, criminal case takes place. And the court have said, no, no, that's detention, administrative detention. Uh, this is a criminal trial. The two are different, not banned by Article 7, Clause 2. So the courts have been rather uh, narrow in their interpretation of double jeopardy. Uh, unlike the Privy Council in Singapore, uh, which uh, interpreted double jeopardy more uh, realistically and said, no, you can't punish a person twice for the same offense in whatever forum it is. Equality, Article 8, subject to many significant exceptions. We have a right to equality. I just want to point this out to you. This is the core article in other world constitutions. Equality is not just racial equality, gender equality. Uh, equality actually can also mean that no law should confer on a public authority an absolute discretion. So in some countries, courts have used the equality doctrine to say no absolute discretion is permissible because that enables the executive to treat like as unlike. So if I'm the Minister for Home Affairs uh, uh, under the Printing Presses Act, I can give you a license or refuse you a license or impose any conditions I deem fit and the courts cannot interfere. To me, that's a violation of the equality doctrine. Tender exercises in the public sector can be questioned on the equality doctrine. Any ouster clause which excludes judicial review is a violation of the equality doctrine because in some cases, courts can come into the picture. In other cases, parliament says no judicial review. That's a violation of equality. This is a generic article, a generic right, but it's undeveloped in this country. Freedom of movement. Uh, India, the courts have said movement includes movement abroad. 
in Malaysia, the courts have refused movement abroad as part of Article 9. Speech Assembly Association, this is the least protected right, least protected, because to freedom of speech in Article 10, Clause 1A, Parliament has imposed eight restrictions, which I earlier read to you, order, security, incitement to an offense. Elsewhere, other restrictions are imposed. All in all, there are 14, one, four restrictions on free speech. So the right is predominantly residual. Uh, the right is available against the executive, not against parliament. If parliament wishes to impose restrictions, there are 14 grounds on which it can impose restrictions. Freedom of religion, despite what some of you may think, this actu actually was, still is, one of the better protected uh, rights in the country, though I know lately there have been a number of uh, um, controversial and very sad, tragic issues. Um, there is no right to education, uh, but there, is, there are rights in respect of education. Uh, the difference is this, that I can't go to the court and say, uh, I have a right to university education, uh, give me a place or give me a scholarship. No, but once educational facilities are available, then there are some restrictions uh, that uh, subject to Article 153, you cannot discriminate on grounds of gender or race, etc. Right to property is well protected. There are other constitutional rights, for example, citizenship rights, right to vote, right to contest. Surely, citizenship right is one of the most fundamental rights. Well, it's in a separate chapter. Then. That's all right. Right to vote, right to contest elections, safeguards for civil servants, right to right of preventive detainees, to some due process. There are implied rights. I mentioned earlier the jurisprudence of implied, unenumerated, non-textual rights has taken roots in some judicial decisions. The seeds are there they need to germinate in the years to come. Uh, international law, there's a large body of international law. Sadly, our constitution does not recognize international law as law in Article 160, Clause 2. But wonderfully, some judges have accepted international law. Nor Fadila Ahmad Saikin, uh, a trainee teacher, became pregnant. They dismissed her. They said, look, uh, we uh, were hiring you to replace those who have gone on maternity leave. Uh, now you are also pregnant. Uh, you are dismissed. She went to the court and she said this is gender discrimination. At the lower court level she lost, but at the court of appeal level the court said this is gender discrimination. And the judge, uh, uh, wonderfully, the judge quoted from international covenants. Uh, and I personally think she's entirely right in importing international law for this reason. Article 160, Clause 2 says, law includes A, legislation, B, common law, C, custom. It doesn't say law means. It says law includes. In other words, the definition is inclusive, not exclusive. The judges are entitled through creative interpretation to read into the Constitution other um, issues of law, other types of law, like international law, um, equity, uh, um, and um, principles of morality and justice. So there are some good decisions, but by far and large, international law is not law, and sadly, the government has not ratified most international treaties. Um, now, most of the above fundamental rights I mentioned seem to be protected against the executive, not so much against parliament. Because Parliament has been given the power, for example, on freedom of speech, 14 grounds on which they can restrict. Powers against subversion and emergency, a constitution drafted during the communist emergency, uh, understandably took note of the need to empower the state uh, to impose restrictions on uh, grounds of subversion, on grounds of emergency. And uh, uh, the Malayan constitution definitely uh, um, the executive and parliament with uh, wide powers. Uh, emergency is much broader, 150. 149 uh, allows parliament to restrict four fundamental rights. Emergency allows parliament to restrict all fundamental rights except freedom of religion. Um, even after the lifting of the emergency in 2012, 
many laws permitting preventive detention are still in place. The National Security Council Act re-enacts many provisions of the repealed emergency ordinances. Constitutional monarchy of the Yang de Pertonagong and the state rulers are required by the federal and state constitutions to act on the advice of the elected government um, in the whole range of their constitutional functions. Um, in a small enumerated area, very small area, however, royal discretion is allowed. Um, however, on this issue, uh, scholars as well as the public are deeply divided. The Malay tradition is of, is of an absolute monarchy. And many Malays genuinely believe that, like in the Malacca Sultanate, the rulers have very wide discretion to appoint anyone as the chief minister, anyone as the prime minister. For example, during the crisis in Salangor, it was generally believed um, um, that the Sultan of Salangor can appoint anyone he likes, reject anyone he likes uh, as the Mantri Basa. So there's a large number of people who uh, adopt a historical interpretation. This is not illegitimate. It's one way. You take the constitution, you interpret it historically in the light of history. Uh, there are some others, many non malays included, who believe that the powers of the sultans are very broad because they see the sultans and the Majlis Raja Raja as a check and balance institution. They would like to strengthen it so that it can provide a check and balance to the unlimited powers of the political executive. However, in my personal, in my personal view, um, the overall scheme of the constitution is that the monarchs are required to reign, not to rule. In actual practice, however, the historical tradition of an absolute monarchy lingers in many minds. Uh, you remember uh, a few weeks ago, Tun Mahathir uh, uh, wrote something on the blog where he said, Yang Di Pertonagong can declare emergency in his personal discretion. With all due respect to Tun Mahathir, uh, he has changed his views since the time he was prime minister. Uh, uh, when he amended the constitution in Article 66, um, that was not his view, and not, not the view of his attorney general either, Tan Sri Talib at that time. There is a fair amount of case law from the Privy Council to the federal court, uh, to the high court, that the declaration of emergency is not a discretionary function of the Yang Di Pertuanagong. Because Article 40, Clause 1A is very clear. In the exercise of all his functions under the constitution and laws, the Yang Di Pertuanagong shall act on advice. So wherever you come across the word Yang Di Pertuanagong in any law, any law whatsoever, constitutional law or statute law, any law, read to it, Yang Di Pertonagong acting on advice. The exception would be where the constitution explicitly says, the Yang Di Pertonagong shall have discretion, like Article 40, Clause 2, which says, Yang Di Pertonagong shall in his discretion exercise the following powers, appointment of prime minister, premature dissolution of the Dewan Ra'ayat, and there are two other areas. Uh, a remarkable thing that has happened in Malaysia is this, and I, I mention this as an observer, not as a critic. In England, the queen is all powerful legally, but constitutional conventions have limited her powers and have reduced her to a constitutional monarch. So conventions have converted an absolutist monarchy to a constitutional one. In Malaya, the 1957 constitution clearly created a constitutional monarchy. But conventions are converting a constitutional monarchy into an absolutist monarchy in many, many areas. So uh, the process is uh, rather the other way around in this country. Uh, some people may say that's good, so that's up, up to you. Conference of Rulers, a very august, unique institution, uh, has a number of uh, functions uh, along with electing and removing the Yang Di Pertonagong, consent to 10 enumerated constitutional amendments, only 10. The Majlis Raja Raja has no right to veto 
the National Security Council Act or the Penal Code or the ISA or uh, um, any such law. In 10 enumerated areas, enumerated in Article 159, Clause 5, the Majlis can say no. In some respects, the Majlis is a constitutional auditor because it can call up any issue, any issue whatsoever, federal or state, and discuss and deliberate and ask the government of the day to give an explanation. But the views of the Majlis are not binding on the government. The Majlis has the power to deliberate, but not to decide. The decision is still that of the government of the day. Affirmative action, one of the unique features of the Malaysian constitution is that affirmative action policies are written into the constitution, and not only written into the constitution, they are protected by the law of sedition. Affirmative action is not only for the Malays, but also for the natives of Sabah Sarawak. Though I must quickly mention, Article 153, by far and large, was a pretty balanced article. It has not worked that way. It has not been interpreted that way. Just to give an example, Article 153 says, privileges or special position will apply in four areas, and in four areas only. What are those four areas? Um, positions in the public services permits and licenses given by the government, post-secondary education facilities, and uh, scholarships, um, exhibitions, and such facilities. Only four areas. But what is happening is that those who are administering the law are actually indulging in across-the-board reservations and quotas, which uh, actually were not contemplated by the Constitution. Uh, Article 153 also clearly says, along with protection of the rights of the Malays and the natives of Sabah Sarawak, uh, the Yang Di Pratonagong shall protect the legitimate interests of other communities. It was a pretty balanced article, balancing the special position of uh, the uh, um, Malays uh, and in 63 natives along with the others. It has not been interpreted or enforced that way. Justice is never in legislation. Justice is in administration. It is in the administration of laws that actually justice or injustice is done. You can have bad laws enforced sparingly. You can have good laws enforced uh, oppressively. And uh, uh, it can make a difference. Special amendment procedures. Um, parliament is not supreme. It must amend the constitution but only in accordance with procedures. Uh, there are some special procedures, uh, two-third majority, consent of Majlis Raja Raja, uh, consent of the Yang Di Pratho Negeri Saba Sarawak, and there are some, just one type of amendment. If you want to modify the territories of a state, you've got to go to the, uh, you've got to go to the uh, State Assembly, Article 2B. Uh, I have to rush through. We have a parliamentary government, unlike the American uh, independent government, parliamentary government means the government belongs to parliament. There is no separation of powers. The minister sits in parliament, the minister sits on the treasury benches. He is executive as well as parliament. The purpose here is this, that he must be answerable, accountable, responsible to the executive. Hasn't worked quite well that way. In theory, parliament is the grand inquest of the nation. It hasn't quite worked that way because the executive controls parliament. In the legislative sphere, parliament legitimates. It does not legislate. The executive has captured the legislative process. A myriad of parliamentary techniques, which other countries are to lesser or greater extent successful, uh, are not working well. Question time, motions of no confidence, motions for debate on other issues, parliamentary committees on bills, other inquisitorial or departmental committees. Um, in some countries, they work uh, to various degrees. Uh, in Malaysia, they are not working. Uh, let me just mention one quirk, one funny part of constitutional law. The American government is independent government. The president and the cabinet are not answerable to the legislature. Um, president may be Democrat, 
Senate, House, maybe Republicans, the president is safe in his place. In actual practice, however, the president's cabinet is answerable to uh, congressional committees in a way that is quite remarkable. Um, uh, the press is present and they ask the most searching questions. So there's, their independent government is actually quite responsible. Our responsible government is quite independent. <laughs> Electoral democracy, very large area, uh, periodic election, universal adult suffrage, uh, an independent election commission. His safeguards are like those of a superior court judge, uh, the uh, safeguards for election commission members. A unique feature of the electoral landscape is that rural constituencies may have less than one half of the population of urban constituencies. What is rural, what is urban is not defined by the Parlambagan. It left to the election commission less than one half. How much less than one half? Not defined. Bicameral federal parliament, we have two houses at the federal level, one house in the states. Devan Rayat can bypass the Devan Nagara uh, under Article 68. Devan Nagara is primarily nominated. That was not so in 1957. In 1957, there were 16 nominated members and there were 22 state senators elected by the state. So state senators were numerically larger. Now it is 44 nominated senators to 26 state senators. So two-thirds of the senators are nominated, whereas in 1957 it was 16 nominated, 22. So the Devan Nagara has been in that respect captured by the executive. Uh, unicameral state assemblies, they are elected, except Sabah, there are six appointed assemblymen. I think there is some violation of the Article 8 equality before the law, why Sabah must have uh, six non-elected assemblymen, up to six, uh, unless the law has changed. Islam is the religion of the federation, but there is freedom to other communities to practice their own religions in peace and harmony. Despite the adoption of Article 3, however, our country was not meant to be a theocratic Islamic state. Article 4, Clause 1 says very clearly, this constitution is supreme. And may I point out to you, Article 3, Clause 4, it says very clearly, nothing in this article, this article is Article 3, Islam, nothing in this article derogates from any other provision of this constitution, implying thereby that nothing in Article 3, Clause 1, that Islam is the religion of the federation, takes away anything found anywhere else. In other words, Article 3, Clause 1 does not override the chapter on fundamental rights, does not override Article 4, supremacy of the Constitution, does not override federal state division of power. So Article 3 is there, but it is to be read with the rest of the Constitution. It is not the core principle of the Constitution, but that's not the way things have been interpreted since the 90s or so. Matters of Islam are generally assigned to the states, but state power to legislate on Islam does not cover the entire field of Islamic law. Um, many of you may think Islamic law is only about marriage and divorce and polygamy. Uh, on the contrary, actually, Islamic law covers trade and commerce, banking. There is a lot of international law of war and peace. Islamic law is the whole range of Islamic laws. States have power only over 23 plus 1, 24 enumerated topics of Islamic law, most of which actually are personal law matters. The state assemblies are generally regarded as having power over Islam. That is an exaggeration. They have only power over 24 areas of Islam. Other areas of Islam are in federal hands. What can be more Islamic than the Hajj? Than the Hajj. The Hajj is a federal matter. Islamic banking is a federal matter. Islamic criminal law, murder, uh, uh, rape, theft, these are part of penal code, these are part of the federal provision. However, I, I know the popular perception is Islam is in state hands. That's not true, constitutionally speaking. Only 24 topics of Islam uh, are, uh, some count 23, some say 24, 25 topics 
are in state hand. Secondly, in criminal law, the states are allowed to punish offenses against the precepts of Islam, subject to some limitations. If the states create Islamic offenses, then they have to make sure the offense does not exist under federal law. Thus, most crimes, including hudud offenses like murder, theft, incest, homosexuality, rape, they are hudud offenses, but they cannot be created by state assemblies because these are in the federal penal code. Almost all state assemblies punish homosexuality. Homosexuality is a federal offense. It's called carnal intercourse against the order of nature. It's a federal offense. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying homosexuality uh, should be promoted. I'm not saying that. I'm saying which is the forum for legislating and for punishing. Under the Constitution, the forum is federal. But almost all states are legislating uh, offenses, betting, gambling, homosexuality, hudud offenses actually are covering murder. Penalties for Sharia offenses cannot exceed the 365 formula, three years jail, six lashes, and 5,000 fine. Sharia courts exist under state law and have jurisdiction only over Muslims. Very clearly the Constitution says they have jurisdiction only over Muslims. Since the late 80s, however, there is civil society pressure to move in the direction of an Islamic state with supremacy of the Sharia and uh, as the cardinal principle. The ruling party uh, has taken note of this spirit of the people, folks, guys, and they are moving in that direction and the judges are responding and the constitution is undergoing what could be called silent, unspoken, inarticulate changes. Some say, uh, very good, some are afraid. My personal view is this. A constitution is not a permanent document. It can change, but it must be done openly. It must be done according to procedures, not by uh, surreptitious amendments. For example, Article 12, Clause 4 says, education of a child under 18 is the responsibility of the parent or guardian. But the 11th schedule says, Singular includes plural and plural includes sing singular. So till 1971, the Bahasa Malaysia translation of parent or guardian was Ibu Bapa. The Attorney General's office, and that's what I mean by surreptitious amendment, Attorney General's office changed after 71, is it? Uh, they amended the constitution to say Ibu Atau Bapa. So now actually one parent can convert, whereas actually if you read the Article 12, Clause 4, along with the 11th schedule, it clearly says singular includes plural and vice versa. So these surreptitious changes are what trouble me as a student of constitutional law. In 1988, an Article 121, 1A was inserted into the Constitution forbidding civil courts from interfering in any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. I think this amendment uh, is justified. Um, a civil court should not interfere with purely personal matters, but the amendment was badly drafted. It says civil courts cannot interfere in any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. The amendment didn't say who determines, who determines the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. So what is happening is this, Sharia courts interpret their jurisdiction expansively. Civil courts interpret their jurisdiction narrowly. And many, many areas which are clearly in federal hands are actually being determined by the uh, Sharia court. So in this respect, um, things um, are not going quite according to the constitutional scheme. I'm sorry, time is a problem. Acquiescence of the superior civil courts to this Islamic state sentiment is not unanimous, but is widespread and is uh, uh, reshaping the constitution. Uh, I'll have to skip uh, much of this, I'm sorry, uh, but I understand that you'll be getting this uh, um, um, essay on the internet, so you can uh, get it from there. Uh, independent judiciary, all judges to, to our superior courts take an oath to preserve, protect and defend the constitution. Since they have to defend the constitution, they must be independent of the executive. Well. 
I think the constitution is quite good in securing independence from the executive. Judges stay in office till 65. They cannot be dismissed by parliament. They cannot be dismissed by the prime minister. In England, judges can be dismissed by parliament. In the USA, they can be dismissed by the Congress. In Malaysia, there must be a judicial commission of minimum five brother and sister judges. I used to tell my students, in Malaysia, a judge cannot be dismissed. It would be difficult to find five brother judges, sister judges, to victimize a brother judge. In 88, we had to eat our words. Uh, and not only Tun Saleh, two other brother judges were dismissed. However, as I said earlier, the law is okay in terms of security of tenure. It's the administration. I mean, the Malays have uh, the nice saying, Harap Khan Pagar, Pagar Makan Padi. What do you do? When the fence eats up the crop, you built a fence to protect the crop, the fence ate up the crop. The judges, the judges actually uh, basically destroyed the safeguards. Uh, however, on the issue of independence of judiciary, two issues, two further issues need to be pointed out. We always thought independence meant that judges must have protection from the executive. Sadly, we found out there is another danger judge being subjected to pressure from his brother judges. There is one case at least on record where the judge in his judgment said it is an insult to our independence that I should receive a call from Kuala Lumpur asking me to decide a case in a particular way. He put it on record in the Malayan Law Journal. And it is widely believed that Chief Justice had uh, advised him to decide a case this way. So Independence doesn't only mean independence from the executive, but from your brother judges, and of course from civil society pressures. Tyranny is tyranny. Whether it comes from the executive, or it comes from a pressure group, or from a lobby, tyranny is tyranny. So we have to rethink how to protect judicial independence, not only from the executive, but from strong pressure groups and from other brother judges. And there is a further dimension of independence. Independence from whom? And independence from what? Judges must be independent of bias. They must be independent of prejudices, preconceptions. When they decide as a judge, they must decide fairly impartially without taking note of religion or race or region. Uh, that is something no law can safeguard. No law can safeguard. That's a matter of character and integrity, but it's something to be taken note of. Uh, impartial public service, I have just uh, uh, three more points, uh, uh, Dr. Hong. Impartial public service, they have a fair amount of safeguards. Uh, under Article 135, they cannot be dismissed without a proper hearing. They have pensions, they have many other benefits. But of course, here again, whether they act independently, professionally or not, these issues have come up in those states where opposition has taken over. Civil servants have uh, uh, come under a lot of criticism for having dual loyalties. But in some respects, the Constitution was badly drafted in some areas. For example, in every state ex quo, the legal advisor is from the Pajavat Pogam Nagara. The financial officer is from MOF. The state secretary is from JPA. I find that a little bit funny. Um, he's an opposition state, opposition chief minister, opposition exco, who is sitting in the exco. Uh, the state secretary from the federal government, the state financial officer from the government, the state legal advisor. I, I think in this respect, uh, we are not a true uh, federal system. Indigenous features, uh, the document of destiny, if I may call the constitution, uh, that was adopted in 1957, bore the mark of idealism as well as realism. It blended the old and the new, the indigenous and the imported, ideas of Westminster and the experience of India mingled with those of Malaya to produce a unique form of government. A lot of indigenous features were there, but of course there was a lot of Indian constitution, British constitution. In 1963, when the federation was reconstituted, a very significant changes were made. 83 articles or so were rewritten to uh, provide for the special protection for Sabah Sarabak. And my final point is rule of law, check and balance. 
The Constitution does not anywhere employ the terms rule of law, separation of power, check and balance, independence of the judiciary, or limited government. Nowhere do, you, do we find these words. But clearly, these ideals animated the Constitution. Now, at the executive level, the Conference of Rulers uh, was placed as the constitutional auditor in some areas. The Yang Di Pratonagong was given discretion in some critical fields. For example, premature dissolution. Agong can say no, and that is his power. Parliament was meant to be the grand inquest of the nation, ensuring responsibility. Judiciary was trusted with the responsibility to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, to be the balance wheel of federalism, to safeguard human rights, to deliver equal justice. Many constitutional bodies and constitutional law doesn't emphasize them. Um, but they were created to enforce accountability. AG is a check and balance mechanism. Independent Auditor General, Election Commission, Armed Forces Council, Judicial Legal Service Commission, Police Force Commission, Public Services Commission, Education Services Commission, National Land Council, National Council for Local Government. We rarely hear about them. Actually, they were supposed to keep federal-state relationships smooth and equitable. How these institutions have worked or not worked and whether they have become too politicized, too politicized is a matter of opinion. All that can be said is that proper systems are in place. We have a good constitution. It is people who can make the difference. Um, by way of conclusion, I wish to say, in 1957, the monumental challenge was to reconcile the seemingly irreconcilable conflict of interest between the major races, religions, and linguistic groups. I want to say this to you, the Malaysian constitution, the Malayan constitution reconciles these conflicts better than many other constitutions, many others. Um, and I say that not uh, uh, with a view to pleasing anyone. I have experience of living in India and Pakistan. Uh, look at Sri Lanka, look at Myanmar, uh, look at southern Thailand, look at southern Philippines, look at Greeks, uh, look at Lebanon, Afghanistan. Um, for that matter, actually, what happened, what happened in Yugoslavia? Uh, what's happening in Chechnya? I, I think Malaya was fortunate that the leaders, the forefathers, were men of vision. They were men of compassion. They were never nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. They should have been. Not because they ended war, but because they created conditions of peace. The Malay Muslim features of the Constitution were balanced by other provisions suitable for a multi-racial, multi-religious society. In 1963, Sabah Sarawak was given special protection. All in all, I think the spirit that animates the Constitution was one of moderation, compassion, and compromise. A carefully balanced document, that's what we had. Uh, this is one of our great bl blessings. 59 years, the Constitution still survives. Uh, however, um, politicization of our institutions has taken place. A conservative, obscurantist, and aggressive version of Islam from the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia, um, the Wahhabi version. Um, um, Malays actually were always uh, very tolerant, moderate, compassionate. But now there is a shift towards a Sahabi Salafist version of uh, Islam. But the hallmark of Malay society uh, was tolerance. Uh, Indonesia, the hallmark is tolerance. The increasing Arabization of Malay society, subordination of the constitution to religious oligarchies are undermining the constitution and impacting negatively on the rights, not only of non-Muslims, but of Muslims. I can't deliver a speech on Islam without getting a ta'uliya, a letter of authority from the Sharia authorities. Unless it is at my home, I can't deliver a talk on Islam without getting a ta'uliya. But what about my free speech? What about my right to free speech under the Constitution? I'm just an ordinary law lecturer, not a graduate of Al-Azhar or Medina. Uh, Dr. Haji Asri, Mufti, former Mufti of Iraq, Again, Mufti, but at that time he was former Mufti of Para, came to Salango to deliver a sermon at an Usra, 
a, a religious gathering on a Thursday evening at a private house. He was arrested for giving a charama without a ta'uliya from the Salangor authorities. Now, this is not what the constitution laid down. But there is a, a, a very strong religious oligarchy that is undermining the constitution. Are we moving towards a Saudi version of an Islamic state? Are we going to have one country, two systems? I went to um, um, the foreign ministry for one uh, talk and someone asked me, uh, what do you think of one country, two systems? Or two systems of laws, two systems of courts for Muslims and non-Muslims? Uh, only time will tell the shape of things to come. There are currents and cross-currents. Uh, all that I can say is the constitution is in flux and undergoing very silent, unwritten changes. Thank you very much for your patience.